Good evening. It's been 28 hours now since the announcement of the death of the Queen. For many, the rhythm of normal activity today has been affected by a sense of loss, of change and of history. And all that against the backdrop of the machinery of royal succession. This afternoon, there were shouts of God save the King as King Charles III returned to Buckingham Palace as head of state. Tonight, we'll take stock of the long life and legacy of the Queen, and we'll speak to two of those at her right-hand side during some of the country's most difficult periods. And we'll look at what the end of this chapter of history and the beginning of the next means for you, our country's identity, the Commonwealth and the world. Let's reflect on the passing of that age and on the new one that we're entering into with historian Simon Sharma. Also, the former High Commissioner of Barbados, Guy Hewitt, and campaigner Esther Ranson. Uh, welcome to Newsnight, all of you. Uh, Simon Sharma, this transition mm. from Queen to King Charles III, how important is it for the monarchy and its survival that they get this right? Oh, it's incredibly important, really. Um, the Queen was such success that doing something which is unbelievably tricky. Namely, you have to be both familiar and remote at the same time. You have to preserve the kind of mystery and the magic, but you need to be seen being at ease with the people, which the Queen was you know, very good at until she wasn't occasionally, only twice famously, those eight days after the Aberfan disaster, mm -hmm. and even more notoriously, not getting to London after the death of Diana. So, but other than that, she had extraordinary intuitive emotional intelligence for regular people, for ordinary people. Um, constitutional monarchy is a funny thing, I think, Victoria. Um, you know, because it has to pull off this sense of ceremoniousness and empathy at the same time. Very hard to do that. But as the world becomes more poisoned by the abrasiveness of politics, people want a space to say we belong to the nation, we belong to a community, and we can go somewhere which is not you know, dedicated to mutual ideological or actual extermination. We can be, this is a place with, it, bathed in the affection for the monarchy where you know the monarch doesn't belong to a party. So. What has to happen in a transition is so tricky because he has to sustain the sense of the country as a family and with his own family, mm. which has had its own rocky history and still does with Harry and Meghan. Um, and at the same time, you know, embody all that history, all that tradition, all that ritual. He made, I thought, an incredibly impressive speech um, that was televised to St Paul's yes. because he did it as he said, as a father and a son. And we'll talk more about, yeah. about the address in a moment, if we may. Esther Ranson, a, a really straightforward question. What was your emotional response when you heard the news of the death of the Queen? Is that addressed to me? Esther, it was to you. Yes, it Victoria, was, yes. I'm so sorry. No, that's all right. So sorry. The sound's not very good. Well, um, I think I found myself unexpectedly in tears. I think an awful lot of people felt that way. But you know, one aspect of the Queen's contribution throughout her life, which I don't think has been properly assessed, is to the voluntary sector, to the charities. I often think the royal family is underestimated for the impact they have when they attend an event, if they're fundraising, if a charity is fundraising, you can sell out, you can sell all your tickets, provided you've got a member of the royal family there. And if you'll pardon me pointing this out, over my shoulder there is one of my favourite photographs of the Queen attending a charity, I believe it was for homeless young people. Mm -hmm. And uh, they'd, they'd been very careful to put barriers so that you were exactly in the pen where you were supposed to be. And one of the chief executives began to leap like a gazelle over the barriers, which caused the Queen to roar with laughter. Mm -hmm. And I just loved seeing her laugh like that and also appreciated so much the fact that because she was there the charity got publicity the charity got money it made a huge difference 
Guy here, you supported the removal of the Queen as head of state, as I understand it. Well, in a sense, speaking in my role, my previous role as High Commissioner for Barbados, yes. the pursuit of self-determination of our nation, having a citizen as our head of state, I think was an important journey for Barbados, as it has been for a number of countries within the Commonwealth. Yeah. But, but I understand yes. you do think sh the Queen was good for the Commonwealth. The Queen has been remarkable for the Commonwealth mm. and, and I have paid tribute to her in the past actually previously on Newsnight because unlike other colonial powers that held on to this European arrogance, the Queen was able to transition easily from being a monarch and a sovereign of these nations to becoming a peer to newly emerging head of, heads of state from around the Commonwealth. And I think that was remarkable and crucial to keeping the Commonwealth um, together. Her visit to Ghana in the early 60s was, I think, a watershed for the Commonwealth. And it was her role and her decisiveness at that time that really showed her leadership and her commitment to this Commonwealth of family of nations. Simon Sharma, what will the monarchy be like under King Charles III? Well, I think it's probably going to have to slim down a little. Um, I mean, I don't know for sure, but it'd be surprising. I mean, that's been spoken of, really, as a reform he's likely to subscribe to. Not all the royals may be uh, on, you know, the, the public budget anymore. I don't know. But actually, I, I think in some sense, actually, a kind of core monarchy of, um, of King Charles and Queen Consort Camilla and... William and Catherine and so on and their children probably you know will serve it very well on the other hand um, I, I the, the one thing of course actually which is so startlingly different from when the Queen came to the throne nobody knew what the Queen if she had no ideas about anything really and, that, and she may not have known what idea she had exactly mm. her father died so young yeah. except exceptionally traditional ideas and that both her father and her uncle never wanted to be king Charles on the other hand everybody knows what his ideas are but the central one the fate of the earth climate change has been an obsession of his a, a good benevolent obsession 30 40 years or so so whether or not he's quite able to be so tight-lipped as his constitutional norms dictate he should is the moot point. My own feeling is that actually he'll do best when he is completely himself, which isn't to say he'll go on a raw supporting this or that party or mm. opposing this. He won't do that. But the Queen, I think, is often... But he, he, can't, he can't be completely himself, can he? L no. Let me bring... Mm. Let me bring in Esther, if I may. Esther, I'm just coming back to you. I mean, do you think he can, you know, can he achieve the kind of respect that the Queen achieved over many years? The sound is so bad, Victoria, I can barely hear what you're, you said to me. Would you mind asking me that question again? So sorry. No, that's all right. Is Charles going to be as popular as his mum? Oh, right, yes. Well, I think... I think I was listening to Simon Chalmers talking about slowed down royalty and I think we need them. I mean, if you take the Countess of Wessex, Sophie Wessex, who is um, the president of the NSPCC and Childline, she contributes so much. There are so many other things that uh, really we depend upon. Um, quite a wide royal family for their, as I say, their contribution to the the voluntary sector. One of the last times I met the Queen, um, I, it was in 2011, actually. I'm going and, to have to ask um, you to be brief, I hadn't realized Esther. that she was... Right. I won't tell you about how she helped me set up the Silver Line, but she was terrific. Was she? Well, I'm, gl I'm glad to hear that. Um, Guy Hewitt, very briefly, the Commonwealth under King Charles III, what does he have to do to make sure the Commonwealth survives? As Simon said, he brings a lot of the values that the Commonwealth are concerned about, climate change, small states, sustainable development, but also he provides a continuity from Her Majesty, and that was an important decision when the heads decided that he would succeed her. And I think 
he will have his own um, style of uh, his own reign, but I think he's going to do it magnificently well. I think I have every confidence he's had a long time to prepare for this role. He has his ideas, but I think they are what the 21st century needs. Okay. Thank you, all of you. Esther, thank you so much for bearing with us with the delay on the line. We do appreciate it. Esther Ranson, Guy Hewitt and Simon Sharma, thank you for coming in. That's all from us tonight. Next week, Newsnight will be broadcasting special programmes from across the four nations of the UK as the period of official mourning continues. On Monday